Happy Wednesday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com, of which I happen to be the Grand Poobah. Oh, what is going on here? Hopefully uh, the sound is working okay. I just had a little pop-up message jump up here. But uh, it's showing the microphone's working, so fingers crossed. Hey, Xalera X1 is popping in. John Vogel is back. Good to see John Vogel popping in for a War Game Wednesday. Because that's what tonight is. It is War Game Wednesday. So, Led Magnus popping in chat too, saying everything's fine. Cool. Yeah, I just suddenly got a little message from, uh, from my Adobe program that I use to run my microphone through. And uh, I was like, what? Huh? It's like... Hardware has changed. I'm like, what? No, it hasn't. I haven't done anything. What's going on? So, uh, I was going to say, sound was all good earlier when I was checking the sink. So, I don't know. Anyway, tonight is Wednesday, August 14th. This is episode 344 of The Daily Dope. It is a live show. So, this is a live stream. This is the first time you're catching the show. Do want to point out it's very, very casual. Just hanging out, talking about tabletop games, sometimes a little pop culture stuff as well. And of course, it's a Wednesday night, so that means I'm tackling war games. So I am actually going to share a bit of a how to play and review the War of the Worlds, the USA East Coast edition from Dan Verson Games. I will be taking care of that in just a few moments. I'm devoting almost the entire show to the how to play as well as the review. But as I was saying, this is a live show. That means chat is available here on YouTube. It is not on screen. It's one of the ways that I keep some of these stranger commenters at bay. But I do pay attention to the chat. So if you want to say howdy, or maybe you got a question, or maybe there's something about the War of the Worlds you want to get a closer look at or have a question about, by all means, please chime in and I will respond. If you like the video, please give it a quick thumbs up. If you check out some of the videos on the Gaming Gang channel and you like those, by all means, please subscribe. If you do, don't forget, ring that little bell because that will not only notify you of when new videos get uploaded. I uploaded one earlier today for Imhotep the Duel from Cosmos Games. But if you ring that bell, you'll also be notified when the stream goes live within about five minutes or so. And of course, don't forget, visit thegaminggang.com. There's like thousands of articles, hundreds of reviews. Not all videos. There's uh, quite a few uh, written reviews. And uh, I'm going to be posting a new written review from Sammy, who, uh, who does uh, some of my RPG reviews. So that will be either tonight or tomorrow. So uh, we've got Dan from No Enemies here. Nefarious Coel has popped in as well. So Nefarious says, what if I warn you about the Martians invading right now? I won't believe you, man. I won't believe you. Although I got to admit, I am a huge fan of the uh, Orson Welles Mercury Theater presentation. I think it's really cool. I really do. I think it's really cool. All right. So before I jump into the War of the Worlds, let me talk about what's coming up on the show both this week and next week. No news today. I was running around for most of the day. Plus, I figure the how to play in the review is going to take a bit of time with uh, the War of the Worlds anyway. But I do want to talk about what's coming up this week and next. On tomorrow's show, probably no news on tomorrow's show either because we are going to dive into the two-volume slipcase edition of Delta Green. Yes, the Delta Green role-playing game from Arc Dream Publishing. If you didn't have a chance to check out my interview with Shane Ivey and Dennis Detweiler at uh, Gen Con, check it out. Good, uh, good interview. Had a lot of fun. 
So that's on tomorrow's show. Friday, I will be unboxing and taking a first look at Tribes, which is another of the Gen Con releases from Cosmos Games. So this looks pretty interesting. That's on Friday's show. Monday, I will finally get around to doing my review for Aeon's End, the uh, deck crafting. I want to kind of say deck crafting as opposed to deck building game from Indie Boards and Cards. So that will be on next uh, Monday's show. Tuesday, I will be unboxing and taking a first look at Anomaly, which is from my friends over at Starling Games. This is uh, a one versus many. It's for two to four players uh, where one player plays the Anomaly and the other players are like students, scientific students who are trying to defeat it. And uh, Nefarious is talking about Wall Martians. Then, a week from today, I will be reviewing The Devils to Pay, the first day at Gettysburg from Tiny Battle Publishing, designed by my good pal Herman Lutman. So that's on next War Game Wednesday. Then, next Thursday, I'll be paging through and taking a first look at the Lonely Mountain Region Guide for Adventures in Middle Earth. This is the latest release from Cubicle 7 for Adventures in Middle Earth. And then next Friday, I will be reviewing Roll for Adventure from Cosmos Games. So got lots cooking, lots on the agenda, tons of stuff going on. So uh, Lead Magnet wants to know if I get advanced copies of Yub Magazine. I do not get them in advance. Uh, Usually I will get them about the same time they get shipped out to everybody else. So that is uh, pretty much how that works. Uh, Nefarious is asking, am I going to be getting the second edition of the One Ring? I should be because I actually talked with uh, off, you know, off camera. I was talking with Dominic McDowell and um, they want to make sure that they send me physical copies of their releases because they like the video coverage that I provide for role-playing games because there aren't a lot of people out there outside of, you know, if it's Wizards of the Coast or if it's Paizo, and I have no issue with that, that's fine, but those are usually the two companies that get a lot of video coverage about the role-playing game products most other companies don't. So uh, Dominic really appreciates the job that I do with uh, Cubicle 7 stuff. So yes, I should be seeing the second edition of the One Ring. Uh, it is slated for a November release. I don't know. Plus, you got to keep in mind, here in the U.S., it, we do get things a little bit slower from Cubicle 7. So, And Bones has arrived. So good deal. All right. So we've got, uh, we got a good chat kicking already. So before I jump into my how to play and review of The War of the Worlds, the USA East Coast Edition, I do want to point out, once again, as a reminder, the Gaming Gang and thus the Daily Dope are pretty much not-for-profit endeavors. So if you like the website, if you like the show, if you like the channel, by all means, please consider making a small donation to Lil Bub's Big Fund. That's right, Lil Bub's Big Fund and the American Society for the prevention of cruelty to animals. Little Bub's Big Fund does provide funds to organizations around the United States who care for special needs animals. These animals might uh, be deaf or blind or have mobility issues or require medications every day, or they might be long in the tooth like yours truly. Regardless, these pets do deserve to find loving homes. And that's what Little Bub's Big Fund is all about. Do want to point out 100% of all funds raised for Lil Bub's Big Fund is awarded as grant money. So that is important to keep in mind. So if you you do happen to make a donation and you'd like a shout out on the following show, shoot me an email. My email address is right there, jeffmacalier at thegaminggang.com. And I'll be happy to give you a shout out. Uh, Actually, if you ever have a question about anything or maybe you want to try to see if I can uh, do some reviews or get some coverage out about companies maybe I don't cover, uh, by all means, feel free, shoot me an email. I will point out, anybody that Asmodee owns is very, very difficult 
to get on board with. Fantasy Flight Games was nearly impossible to get review copies for uh, stuff from, and that was before Asmo Day bought them. So, uh, Kabuki Kid has popped in. Good deal. We got a lot of folks hanging out. The Fury says, so many people just focus on D&D. They're one-trick ponies. I don't have it. I don't have an issue. I love, I love all role-playing games as long as they're decent role-playing games. I've seen some crap in my day, but um, I, you know, Fifth Edition, Pathfinder, what have you, Thirteenth Age, you know, whatever you want to play. Rune Quest. I will be showing off the Rune Quest um, core book, probably as a standalone video. Might try to shoot it later this week or over the weekend as well. You're going to notice there's a few more standalone videos popping up just because uh, I've got some stuff that uh, I, don't, I don't want to have too big of a backlog because I don't want to be reviewing games that have been out, you know, like four months when I got them when they were brand new. So that's not really fair. All right. So move right along. I'm sure there are folks out there who are going to be tuning in because I want to see a bit of a how to play and my review of the War of the Worlds. USA East Coast from Dan Versen Games. It is designed by Anald de la Sega? Siaga? Hey, wait a second here. Why are we getting the other image popping up? Damn it. There we go. I'm not talking about Cubicle 7. We were just talking about Cubicle 7. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the fairy says, I won't complain about D&D. But variety, it's the spice of true murder hobos. I got a murder hobo sticker at Gen Con. I was talking to somebody and they, we, I mentioned murder hobos and he started laughing. And he said, uh, yeah, that's not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of people use that term. I was like, really? I'm like, I use it all the time. And uh, they're like, here. And they gave me a murder hobo sticker. Maybe on tomorrow's show, I'll bring it down and, and show it up. I, I didn't put it on anything. I just have it. Anyway, so, as I was saying, The War of the Worlds is designed by Anold de la Siaga. Taking a guess. With artwork provided by Nicholas Triel, it is a solitaire war game. It's for ages, in my opinion, about 13 and up. Plays in about one or two hours. It is available right now. It does carry an MSRP of $59.99. I have seen it online as low as about $43. So just pointing that out, don't get your pants in a bind. Just pointing out that I have seen it for less than MSRP online. So let's move on over to the other camera because I've got this actually set up here. So there is a lot in this box. I will be the first to point this out. So first thing I'm gonna mention is I am not a huge fan of the box artwork. It is, uh, it's just really busy and it almost does like a disservice to the game in my opinion it's just there's just so much going on there's just so much going on on the box artwork so it's not a huge deal but when I, when I got this for review I was kind of like really this is from Dan Burson games with this art yes I, I agree nefarious the box art does look kind of confusing so that said, let's move the box on, out of the way. So a few different things. I'm going to grab a quick sip here. There are tons and tons of counters. I have a bunch of them off to the side down here that you can't really see. It's off, off to the side here. There, I've got a bunch over here. I've got a bunch over here as well. There's a lot... A uh, lot going on in this game. I will point out, you see these circles up here. Those represent different waves of Martian uh, attacks where the cylinders are coming and landing. My noggin is actually blocking out the first one right up here. So Bone says, I love anything, War of the Worlds. Um, I, one, one thing that I'm, I'm going to point out that I like about this is that there, there are little nods to the H.G. Wells novel that you don't necessarily see a lot in War of the Worlds kind of games. So, anyway, we're going to kind of tour the board a little 
and then I'm going to kind of talk about some of the components and then we'll get into a bit of the gameplay. I am not going to go into every tiny little detail about each of the phases simply because I don't want to put people to sleep. So as we kind of tour the board, so as I mentioned, we got five of these circles up here and these circles are where we are going to put our waves of Martian tripods. So to give you an idea, and I'm going to zoom in so we get better looks at some of this stuff. So these are the five tripods that are actually going to make up the first wave, which I already have marked down on the board. And normally what you'll do is you're going to keep these up in the circles here. So we've got the first wave has already landed and they are down in Texas down here. The second cylinder has landed. It is in Minnesota. So this has not opened up yet to release these tripods. So we've got a third tripod, or I'm sorry, third cylinder, third wave, fourth wave, and a fifth wave. We also need to randomly select. And look, it's been a while, but it's true. Lego Batman is back as our opaque container because we need a couple for this game. So we're going to take all of our our land tripods because we have land tripods and we have ocean tripods. So we actually will will draw these at random. So to start off the game, you're going to roll to see, okay, so where does the cylinder land? And we do have a player aid chart that has a lot of this information on it. It's just a fold out chart here. So for an example, and it, I gotta be honest, this is probably not the most intuitive of the uh, player aids that I've seen from Danvers and Games. Hey, Paul Nolan is popping in. It's been a while since we saw Paul. Good to see you, Paul. Thanks for uh, joining us in chat. So we get this uh, new cylinder placement. So we have two dice in this game. They are, they're both the same. So we've got, it's just a six sided die, but we've got colors instead of numbers. So we've got three green sides, we've got two yellow sides and a red side, a red face. So when we roll to see where we have a new cylinder placed, we'll roll one of these dice and then it's gonna tell us either Texas, Minnesota or Florida. I found that a little disappointing because we have We've got the entire East Coast. We've got most of the Midwest over here. And there's only three locations that they're going to land in. I don't know. I would have liked to have seen, honestly, uh, has seen like a 10-sided die. Just so we could see these cylinders drop into other areas as opposed to just those three states. And it's not a huge deal, but to me, it's kind of... I don't know. It was, it's kind of weird that we've got the two dice and we've got three results basically available on the dice. So, anyhow. So, you roll to see where our new cylinder is going to go. Now, when we first start the game off, we also will roll for individual Martian tripods. So, we've got the one wave's already landed. And then we just sit there and we roll. And yellow is... Minnesota, so we're going to put a tripod there, green is Texas, tripod there, another one in Texas, so just kind of give you an idea, so we're going to kind of fill these out, let's throw one down in Florida, yes, normally I'd be rolling a die, but whatever, so that's uh, five, let's get one more, let's go down to Florida. Okay, so you will also notice when I zoom in that the tripods have a colored band down at the bottom. And uh, that is how the uh, artificial intelligence, the AI for the game will control these. So, so anyway, so that is how we've got things set up to start off with. So we've got the different regions and you'll see they're kind of color coded these various different regions. Uh, a little difficult to kind of kind of make out uh, this being this different region than this, even though the colors are almost identical. So we're also going to see these little boxes. 
and we'll get a closer look in just a sec, but these boxes are gonna show us what kind of production we've got going on. So this is uh, our workforce, because we're gonna start the game off, we don't really have anything. We haven't mobilized any troops, anything like that. So the Martians have landed, this is about the turn of the century. I would, I would take a stab that we're probably talking anywhere from about 1890 to 1905-ish, maybe 1910. Because there are some celebrities in this game that I found kind of interesting. I'll talk about in a, in a bit. So anyway, so we've got these different regions. These different regions are also going to show us what their production is. And we use these production points to actually purchase troops, cavalry, guns, uh, naval warships. We can use it to actually move troops around. We can use it if we're using uh, the... Uh, the variant rules that include uh, Nikola Tesla and his technology, which I honestly got to say, you really, really do want to use those those variants because it really adds a, a pretty wild, some wild wrinkles into the game. So, uh, so Nefarious is, is talking about um, a Mars attack reference from Bones because Bones said, loves anything War of the Worlds. Mars Attacks is kind of War of the Worlds. All right, so anyway, so we got the uh, the waves up here. We've got the map here. We have this box here. There's a flying machine. And one of the ways that you lose the game is if the Martians build their flying machine. There are four pieces to the flying machine, and it's possible for them to, to get these pieces. And once that happens, then game's over. The humans have lost. Uh, humans can lose if the Martians get to uh, effectively 100 victory points. It gives them a colonization of 10. So that's one of the ways that the players, the humans can lose as well. So this is not an easy game to win, especially with this little flying machine aspect to it. Because you can be playing and in one turn, the Martians can get a couple of pieces of that flying machine. And you're like, uh-oh, got to be careful. Uh, then we have a sequence of play. So we have different phases. We have a production phase, battle phase, devastation phase, human action phase, escape phase, Martian action phase, and assembly phase. And we will walk through the different phases of the game as well. We also have a box here for if the tripods, tripods move out to sea, which is very possible that they can do that as well. Here we've got a track and we track our production points, we track Martian victory points, human victory points, Martian colonization, as well as the human germ. So, of course, if you're familiar with the War of the Worlds, the way that the Martians are defeated is because of our human germs, our Earth-bound germs end up doing them in. So. That is here as well. So what happens is for every 10 victory points the Martians get, we move up their colonization one spot. For every 10 victory points the humans get, we move up the germ track. So for an example, let's say the Martians were at, let's say they, they went from 7 to 13. So basically what you would do is you you just put it on the 3 you're going to deduct 10 and you're going to move this up to the one. Just like so. There's, uh, I got to admit, there's, there's a little congestion on this track here because we're tracking the victory points. We're tracking those. We're tracking production as well because you're going to add up your production. So, uh, so yes, I, I would have liked to have seen a couple of different tracks, maybe split it down the middle here, had one track here, one track there, as opposed to this larger track. Once again, not a huge deal, but something that I found after a while was kind of like, okay, it's like, oh, don't accidentally move the wrong uh, counter up the track. <laughs> something else I want to point out too is we've got events. And each turn, you're going to have an event. And as you can see, we've got Martian events, Devastation event, Escape event, Martian action event. Shuffle these up a little bit. So 
the way the rules are presented, and the rules aren't badly done, I just, I gotta be honest, I found these to be a little more confusing than I'm used to seeing in a damn person game. I don't know if I was just being a little dense about it as I went through, but, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, there were just some things that I had to keep, like, going back and try, checking out. And uh, usually that is not necessarily the case with a Dan Verson game. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, that the rules are, are really badly presented or anything like that. Just not as intuitive as I'm used to seeing. Uh, and then we got some different scenarios at the back here as well. But uh, there's also, not that we would actually be using this, but we've got, if you've got more than one edition of the War of the Worlds, because there are four. There's the USA East Coast, there's Japan, there's France, and then there's the UK. So if you have more than one, there's actually a, a League of Terran Nations card in here that you can actually kind of tie them together at the same time. So I thought that was kind of cool. I thought that was kind of interesting. Anyway, as far as the rules go, we've got these event decks. So we've got, like I said, and it's pretty much for almost every one of the phases, there's like a little deck. And it's never like really apparent that you're supposed to take all of these little decks and combine them all into a single event deck. And the thing that starts making you scratch your head is as we go through the different phases. So for an example, we see battle phase. It says, if the event card takes place during the battle phase, draw the card and complete the event. And it's kind of like, well, so are you saying that we actually draw a card from all these different decks during like each of the phases? That's a hell of a lot of events going on. But if you look closely, it doesn't necessarily, I don't recall it actually saying in the rules that you're supposed to take all of these cards and put them together in a deck. It just says, this is the event deck. So, like I said, I don't know, maybe I was just being a little dense, but I was sort of like, I don't know, I don't get it, what's going on? And once again, I have to apologize, I still got a little bit of that con crud going on. All right, so anyway, so we got the event deck. So the the back of the card is actually going to tell us what phase this event is going to take place in. So as an example, I just shuffled it up. We've got the production event right there for the production phase. Uh, some other stuff, other, other uh, decks of cards. We've got Nikola Tesla's research cards. This is if you're using the uh, variant for Nikola Tesla, which as I mentioned, you probably want to, because it's pretty funny, Tesla actually creates his own tripod, which are, you can like it, like ramp it up. It's pretty wild. It's pretty cool. Uh, Nefarious says, DVG's warfighter rules were all over the place. As in same rules in different parts, fortunately the game isn't too difficult. I agree with you on that, in fact, I mentioned in uh, my review that there's like a lot of a lot of rules in the Warfighter like rule book that didn't apply to the edition that I had. So uh, I want to say the standard Warfighter rules are like World War II, and I was reviewing the modern, and it was just all this World War II stuff, and it was like, okay. But yes, you're right. Uh, the game is not difficult to get into i really like it i think it's an excellent game once again you got to kind of slog through the rules a little bit but anyway these are the different levels of the tesla tripod so it becomes more and more powerful the more production points you sink into it and there are other items that tesla can build as well so tesla is one of our celebrities another celebrity is amazingly enough mark twain Yes, Mark Twain can be in this game. And Mark Twain is pretty wild because Mark Twain can actually go to a, dest a destroyed area or an area that um, the Martians are like harvesting their red weed 
and turn it back into a productive area. So that's pretty cool. I really, really like that too. We also have a land battle deck and we have a naval battle deck. So we will look at these as I get into the battle phase. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. We're gonna get a little closer look at the board like so. All right, so as I mentioned, we've got two different kinds of tripods. We've got the land tripod and we also have the ocean tripods. So the ocean tripods you're supposed to take and put into another uh, you know, container, a little opaque container. There's only five of them because you won't have a lot of battles at sea. You could have them. You probably will have some, which I thought is very cool because once again, that's a nod to the original novel because one of my favorite parts of H.G. Wells' War, The War of the Worlds is um, the battle between the tripods and uh, isn't it a cruiser? For some reason I thought it was a destroyer, but I'm pretty sure it's a cruiser now that I think about it. One of my favorite parts of, uh, of the novel is that. So anyway, so we've got these. So as I mentioned before, we've got these little colored bands on the bottom of these tripods. I'm gonna just toss that back into Batman's head. So as an example, we've got this is our wave one. This is our wave of tripods that are actually in Texas at the moment. So that's why they, they sit up in the little circle up above so that you're not taking up all this space. Now, I do want to mention that the game comes with a bunch of standees. Problem I had with the standees were it was very tough to get them to open up to actually get these these counters into them uh and of course there aren't enough there aren't enough of these standees for every counter you're going to be utilizing so uh i noticed if you try to try to get these into here and you can't I, i'm using both hands here and it's barely opening up uh you're going to trash these counters you're going to trash these counters trying to get these in to the standees. So I'm like, you know what? Screw the standees. I'm not even going to utilize those. I don't care. All right. So this is the first wave that we've got. And you'll notice that we've got the different colors because the different colors are going to, both in battle and in the uh, Martian action phase, it's going to tell us what each of the colors are going to do. So pretty cool. I, I definitely dug that. So we've got those, we've got the human units. So we have infantry, cavalry, we have field guns, we have siege guns, we have freighters because we are going to have refugees fleeing from the Martians. We also have warships. Now, we will actually be spending our production points on these, and these remain on the board. So these four different unit types will remain on the board. The freighters and the warships, we only will purchase if we have, well, we don't purchase the freighters, actually. If we have refugees trying to flee the ports, and we actually have to spend production points to open up these ports for the refugees to try to escape. So we've got that stuff. We've got other things. We've got powder kegs we can utilize. We have different in inventions that Tesla can come up with. We've got radio. We've got airships. We've got Tesla creates his own death ray. Um, so all these little counters here. Here's Mark Twain. There's Mark Twain. <laughs> so I think it's pretty funny. Um, so let's see. So Nefarious says, would definitely like to have enough stands for all the standees. Stands look as bad as FF <laughs> FF1s. I find the FF1s damage the standee slot. Uh, as far as having enough standees for all of the different counters, 
the reason why you wouldn't is because you're drawing these Martian uh, units, these tripods, randomly. So if you had standees on all of them, they'd be a real pain in the ass for you to be taking out. Plus, you're supposed to be putting like your your units here on standees too. So personally, I just think it's easier just to just lay them down, lay them down in your in whatever state they happen to be in. So anyway, so that's an idea of some of the different counters that we've got. Like I said, we've, we've got Tesla coils. You can drop off Tesla coils. We've got the powder kegs can be turned into sonic kegs. So all these little things that the humans can do and the humans need every, every uh, bit of uh, luck they can get because the Martians are going to be pretty difficult to defeat. So uh, here's an example. Here's the uh, Tesla tripod. And then we've got the different levels of the Tesla tripod. So if you, if you are using Tesla and you have the Tesla tripod, if the Tesla tripod's destroyed, you lose. So, <laughs> so kind of cool. All right, so moving right along. We also have um, these assembling machines, which, uh, which the Martians use. So there's, there's different ways that you can actually approach the way that these cylinders open up. And you can approach it as uh, the standard game is that you've got these assembling machines in Florida, Texas, and Minnesota. And that's where these cylinders end up landing anyway. That's what the cylinder counter looks like, just like that. But uh, there's also a different way where you can have the, uh, this, the assembler machines uh, in various different locations. So, all right. So anyway, uh, let's actually jump on into the game itself. So a few other things, taking a look at the map, when you create your uh, units. So if you have infantry, cavalry, field guns, or siege guns, you can only deploy them where you see a factory symbol. So there are some states that do not have a factory symbol. Strangely enough, in the Midwest, Wisconsin has a factory symbol. Illinois does not. And it's sort of like, um, hey, uh, designer guy, do you not understand how the United States works? Because uh, you would not have factories off in Wisconsin. The factories are located like Illinois, Indiana. They don't have them. So anyway, <coughs> let me grab another quick sip here. So kind of give me an idea. Uh, let's say just for the sake of argument, so I can stay zoomed in here. Let's say we've got the first wave. First wave is in Ohio. Okay, we're pretending that the first wave did not land in Texas. We're, we've got the first wave, it's in Ohio. So our first phase is the production phase. Now, I do want to mention, remember we had our event deck? So our event deck, our first card is actually a pr production event. So the first thing we do in the production phase, if our event card says that phase, we're going to flip this over and it says help from abroad. So we're going to gain 10 production points. So we've got quite a lot of production points because we're totaling up our gear number here. So you see, we've got 12, we got 12, we got 12. So we have a lot of production to start off. Now, one thing I do want to point out is when our first wave lands, that region is destroyed. It's automatically destroyed. Uh, all right, so Dan from No Enemies Here has got to pack it in. Good to see you again, Dan. Have a good one. Uh, yes, so Nefarious is laughing, saying 19th century Chicago was loaded with factories. So was 20th century Chicago and 21st century Chicago. So seeing that I only live in the Chicago area. Uh, so anyway, so we would gain 10 production points, which of course we could put that on our tracker. So we would discard that. And then we see our next turn, we're gonna have a battle event. 
So we've got production. Let's say, as an example, we've got uh, eh, we got 80 points, just for the heck of it. So right here, it's going to tell us how much each of our units will cost. So infantry costs 10, cavalry costs 10, open up a uh, chosen harbor is three, fuel guns 12, siege guns 22, warships four. It's going to tell us different range, movement cost. So infantry cannot damage tripods. The only way that infantry can damage a tripod is if they are still in the cylinder. Then we've got cavalry. Cavalry cannot damage tripods either. But uh, infantry and cavalry can do different things to help out. Hey, Euripides Ghost is popping in. Good to see you. Uh, so uh, Euripides Ghost is saying that they just actually recently bought this game. Cool deal. So infantry and cavalry cannot damage tripods. Field guns can. Siege guns can. Warships can. But the infantry and cavalry do special things. So infantry can build earthworks to help protect your guns. They can build uh, powder kegs uh, in a state. So explosives in that, like traps. Uh, cavalry can help uh, you get battle plans, which is something else you put in an opaque container to give you some advantages during your battle. Uh, cavalry can also help to um, to make the Martian, Martian wave move where you want them to move. They can kind of distract them. Uh, Chosen Harbor, like I said, you can't actually get um, refugees out uh, and score victory points without having open harbors. The field gun, as I mentioned, that can damage tripods. So can the siege gun. And the warship, you only buy warships when you have a sea battle, a naval battle, and uh, it's just one and done. So you spend four production points for each warship. So we've got some battle phase info. We got devastation phase here. So we've got a lot of a lot of the information that we need is right in here, but um, there are other things that just aren't that you have to kind of go back to the rule book. So it, it would have been nice if this was actually dual sided. So here are some of the Tesla's technology: field lasers, Tesla coils, the sonic kegs. So. All right, so anyway, so production phase, we would be building, uh, we'd be building our our forces for this turn. So let's say as an example, say we got 80. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take 20 by two infantry. I'm gonna get a cavalry, so that's 30. Um, 52 because I'll get a couple of field guns as well so I'll I have I've spent 52 of my hypothetical 80 let's say so if this was give you an example if this was like a cylinder like this because when a cylinder lands the tripods don't automatically emerge you're gonna roll uh, it's like the last phase of the game is uh, the assembly phase. You're going to roll to see if the tripods get built. So in a situation like, say, this was a situation I had at the cylinder here, I would actually spend production points to move my infantry. I would probably move everybody, actually, uh, into here so that I can actually attack that cylinder because infantry can destroy tripods in the cylinders. It's important for you to understand that. Um, infantry is, I mean, infantry and cavalry are really just, um, uh, they're not really cannon fodder. I don't want to say cannon fodder. Um, they're, they're more along the lines that they're going to give you extra options as you fight. Really what's important are the field guns and the siege guns. So, all right, so let's say that's what I spent my, my dough on. Production phase is over. Then we move to the battle phase. Now, the battle phase would take place if I have any field guns, if I have any guns, I guess I'll say, in a state 
that has tripods in them. So once again, let's go back to this is this is actually that's actually wave one. So at this point, I don't. So there would not be a battle phase. So we would skip that. But then we go to devastation phase, which is pretty wild. So we got the devastation phase chart right here. So we have wave one is already sitting here. We've got five tripods in that wave. They're sitting in Ohio, right? Yep, Ohio. So you're going to roll a die. All right, so we got yellow. So they're using black smoke. They're using the poison smoke. <clears throat> if you remember the Orson Welles Mercury Theater production, uh, right before they get to the half hour is when the tripods are attacking New York and they're using that poison gas. That's what the black smoke is. So we got a yellow, so it's black smoke. We have five tripods. They're gonna wipe out seven workforce. So we're gonna lose seven workforce from this region. So this region right here, uh, actually, that's above, it's out of sight. So we've got 10. We just took a huge hit, dropping us down to three. And that's gonna go back. It's out of out of sight, but it's just up there. Just like we see these along here. We've got some that are that are above the Midwest, and we got some that are down below the south as well. So that's what that would have done. Now remember, we also have single tripods floating around too. Those are considered waves in certain respects. So, okay, so we have like individuals. So we've got uh, we've got two down in Texas. So for this, for the devastation phase, we would roll the die again. We get a yellow. Oh, I'm sorry. We also got uh, two refugees in Ohio. And we lost two victory points, which we, uh, we wouldn't have actually counted up victory points yet. So in Texas, we would have lost two workforce, got one refugee, and lost the victory point. So our production really gets, really gets hammered very easily with the Martians. And the production is how we buy our units. So we need the production. Uh, and if we're using the variant rules with Tesla, we need production as well because we need to actually research his technology to give us a better fighting chance of, um, of actually being able to defeat the Martians. So I like this devastation phase. I think this is very cool. I think this is very, very interesting. Um, now, for an example, if we have, this is something important to keep in mind. Let's say for an example, we had infantry in Ohio. We don't actually have, there's no battle. We won't have a battle because the infantry can't harm the tripods. So also in the devastation phase, it'll say, it might say minus one unit. See, for an example here, we got panic, minus one unit. We would lose one of our infantry units uh, because it's just basically, uh, they're, they're just, yeah, they've been, they've been killed uh, or they've been, uh, or they panicked or ran off too. So I find it interesting that we can have infantry, we can have cavalry in states that have tripods and not actually fight. So, but once again, you could have the infantry try to build powder kegs, which are like explosive traps and things like that. All right, so let's put these guys back up here. So that would be the devastation phase. Then we have the human action phase. And the human action phase is where we get an opportunity, we can we can move units. So we, we get an opportunity to move units without spending production points. I think, I am almost positive, because it wasn't exactly super clear. But as far as, uh, it tells you that you can move um, infantry, cavalry, field guns, siege guns, and characters can move one state during the human action phase 
refugees can move too. So these refugees are going to try to, they're going to make their way, they're trying to get to ports. So for an example, let's, uh, let's move these refugees to Virginia. Let's say they're going to try to get out uh, in North Carolina. If, but I would have to purchase the uh, port to open that port up. So uh, then other things that take place in the human action phase is, as I mentioned before, we got the infantry. They can attack cylinders to try to destroy tripods still in the cylinders. We got the powder kegs that they can try to build as well. Uh, then after that, we've got the escape phase. Now, the escape phase is when the refugees attempt to make their way out of ports that you have opened up. So as an example, if I had spent three production points during my production phase, I could have, whoa, where did they just go? Could have opened that up. So that, that actually shows that, yes, that port is open. That port, I can get refugees onto ships, onto freighters, and out to sea. When I do that, I get victory points. I get victory points. Humans get victory points for regions that st are still producing. We get victory points for um, refugees that are able to escape. The Martians get victory points for capturing units, capturing refugees, for destroying regions uh they get uh they get points for every region that's destroyed every turn uh if they change it to the red weed because we've got destroyed so for an example this shows uh, let's do this for a second well this would lose us the game if washington dc gets destroyed then we're out so let's do this let's say this was destroyed down here it's possible that the Martians can change a destroyed region to the Red Weed, where if you recall the Steven Spielberg War of the Worlds, uh, that's some pretty creepy stuff. So, so, but they get four victory points for every region that they've got the Red Weed, uh, and it can, that that adds up really fast. The destroyed regions add up very fast as well. That's why Mark Twain if and when he comes into play in this game can be a huge boon for the humans because he can actually go into a destroyed area or a red weed area and bring it back to life, make it produce again. So very, very cool. I, I like, I, I just think it's kind of cool that uh, they've got Mark Twain in the game. So anyway, so we got the escape phase. That's when we've got the refugees trying to escape uh, also, I have to point out that there is a limit to how many refugees can be in a region, and that is the number of gears. That So, for an example, here in this region, we could have 12 refugees. A destroyed region can hold no refugees. You can move through it, you just can't end there. Uh, if for some reason you have more refugees than you do gear points, those excess refugees are considered captured by the Martians, and once again, victory points for the Martians. I, I can't stress it enough. This is not necessarily an easy game for the humans to win. So then we've got the Martian action phase. So the Martian action phase is, we're going to look here on the Martian action phase, and we're going to take a look at what's going on. So we've got Martian action phase, yellow, green, blue. So that whatever region they're in, how much production is still left in this region? Blue is Washington, D.C. So green is uh, that things are still going good. Yellow is uh, things are on their last legs. Also, it shows us in a destroyed or red weed area. We get our Martian victory points here. So as an example, let's say in a green area, we've got a wave. We would be rolling a die and we'd get yellow and it says repair. So what happens there is the Martian wave is not going to move, but any damaged tripods are going to repair themselves. We also have move. We have arrival and split. So arrival means we get another tripod shows up. 
and then that wave splits. We can get pieces of the flying machine made. So remember, four pieces of the flying machine means it's game over for the humans. Now, one thing I had taken a look at, because it's very easy once we get, because remember, we've got six individual tripods that are on the board to start the game. Those are considered a wave. Uh, when I was playing it, it becomes way, way too easy for the Martians to get the four pieces of the flying machine super early. So what I was doing is I was only counting actual waves that come down that are represented by these. Those are what I rolled for. Anyway, so for an example, if we get move, we're going to look to see, okay, so what state are the Martians in? And then we roll the one die and it tells us, okay, so where do they move? Where do they get to? So if they're moving from Texas, they could go to Arkansas. They could move out to sea. They could go to Louisiana. So I thought that was kind of cool too. So we've got, and then if they're at sea, it's possible that they return from sea. <laughs> so where do they come back? They could come back in Mississippi, Maine, or North Carolina. So that is the Martian action phase. So very, very easy to get through that as well. Uh, then we get the assembly phase and the assembly phase is really, really pretty simple. It's just if we've got cylinders and there's an assembly machine there in that state, you're going to roll a die. You're going to roll a die to see if they, they're able to assemble the tripods or not. So easy peasy. So those are the main phases. And you're going to continue going through these phases until either a victory condition is met or a defeat condition is met. Now, the second phase is the battle phase. And I am going to show you how the battle phase works. So with the battle phase, we're going to get this land map. Now, when we have the escape phase, when we've got the... Uh, the refugees heading out to sea to try to escape, they'll actually start off here and try to move out, try to move out to sea. And if they get to this point here, then they escape. Uh, of course, they also have the possibility of tripods trying to stop them. So that is uh, that is the sea battles. I'll show you, eh, we'll take a peek at that in a sec. So we've got the land battle. So let's just grab these. Let's pretend that we've got this land battle going on. And I will zoom out just a little bit more. There we go. So we can get the whole thing in. All right, so we've got, this is our wave. This is where we've got our wave one. So we're going to say our, our troops are going to be fighting the wave one here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look. And pull this chart back out here. So we've got a land battle deck. So we're going to take the first card. So it's going to tell us setup. Okay, setup. We see it shows A, shows green. Any green tripods are going to go into hex A. B is yellow. We don't have any yellow. C is red. We got one red. Purple is D, which is actually blue uh, right here. And then black goes to E. So we have initiative. So the initiative works if it's a state that's got a little hill marker on it, then the humans will have the initiative. If there's no hill on it, then the Martians will have initiative. So basically what we've got here is we have to put our guns somewhere that shows little field artillery. And then we've got some infantry, K, 
cavalry. So we've got the infantry here. So what we do is for the battle, we're going to roll to see if they're able to build earthworks for the guns. Because that's really kind of what infantry does during the battle. Is they're just trying to get earthworks for the guns. So we're going to roll for this infantry here. We get a green. So they were able to build one earthworks. And you just put it right next to the gun here. See what this infantry did here. Green, they built one earthworks as well. So uh, with cavalry, we can see if we could get a random battle plan or a chosen battle plan. So, oops, come on you. So we got green, so we get a random battle plan. I'll just pull one out of here. So it says a trap. So we would be able to set up a trap for the tripods. And of course, you're gonna just jump back into the rule book and they're gonna be like, all right, where we got, whoop, that's too far. Uh, da, 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 da. Roll a die. If you roll green, damage up to two undamaged tripods. If all tripods are already damaged, trap has no effect. So, here we go. Let's hope we get a green. No, damn it, nothing. So much for the trap. Okay, so, let's say for an example, we don't have initiative. The Martians have initiative. So next, what we're going to do is, we're going to draw the next card. And of course, you would you would discard. So by the, when you ran out of land battle cards, you're just going to reshuffle. So it's going to tell us what's going on here. All right, so green is going to move this way, one. This way, two. Yellow is going to try to detect. Well, we don't have any yellow. Red is going to move this way and try to fire. And so we take a look and say, okay, well, are they in range? So you're going to check to see, whoops, and you're going to roll as far as the tripod attacking as far as, they, they only attack guns. That's all they do is they only attack guns. So he has to be able to detect the field piece before he attacks. Now, the thing is, if, uh, for an example, if this tripod moved into here with the infantry, the infantry would be lost. They're, they're just immediately considered to be destroyed. So same with the cavalry as well. Because like I said, they're only looking to try to fight the guns. So then this here, we would have E would be fire all. So they would be able to fire at both these guns here. And then black shows detect, and then they would move. So detection, you're rolling a die see if they can detect the gun and basically what detection does is it removes earthworks earthworks basically take up one hit for each of the guns and you can have more than one you can you can have a bunch of earthworks protecting the guns because you're going to want to have earthworks to do it as well because like i said the infantry and cavalry are just you know like supplementary they're, they're really, they can't damage, they can't do any damage to these tripods here. Okay, so, so then we've got the siege guns, or I should say we've got field guns. So the field guns, uh, let me grab the rule book here. So here, for an example, um, with the Martians, when they attack, if they're at range at one, green gets them a hit. If they're at range two, yellow gets them a hit. If they're at range three, red gets them a hit. So for an example here, he's range three to there. He's one, two, three. That's out of range from him. So remember they were firing all. So you roll two and you get green and yellow. Neither one hits. So for an example, we look at the field guns. In the battle phase, We've got, uh, da, 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 where was it? I'm trying to remember, I thought the field guns have, they got a range of two. Yeah, 
Yeah, fire in a tripod. Oh yeah, it's okay, so it's the same. So so the field guns get to roll once and the siege guns roll twice. So same thing. He'd be firing over here. He rolls once, he's looking for red. Nope. He does the same, looking for red. Yeah, so that's a hit. Yay! So what you do is you would flip him over to damaged. So there's a step reduction to these. So he would be damaged. If we were able to hit him again, we're going to be able to destroy him. But then again, we would have to take our next land battle card and then we apply what's going on with these tripods. So once again, green would be fire and move one. So it's going to fire. So they fired, they hit uh, their range of three. No, so they would not hit. But then they're going to move up one, like so. Then we get yellow, don't have yellow. Red would be move and fire. So once again, they're looking at a three. Oh, they would hit. So they would actually take out the earthworks. So then we've got the blue would be focused fire. So they would be firing at that gun there. And that is a hit. So that earthworks is gone. And then black would be detect. And they are out of range to detect. And then they would move one. So now there's three tripods in that hex there. Then we would go back to the humans. So we would have, okay, so this field gun's going to attack. He's going to try to attack the damaged one. Ah, nothing. And then they just attack well, the black one. Nothing. So you're going to continue on until all the units have been destroyed. Either all of the human units or all of the Martian units. And that will end the battle. So, oh, I, I should say the guns are destroyed uh any like infantry cavalry things like that they can they can escape so yeah pow nice hit uh so so that's basically how the land battles work and there is actually a little counter for you to use for the land battles too so uh, where did it go they were in Ohio over here. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where it went. There's, there's just a, you use it just as a little marker so you don't lose track of who's doing what. So let's say for an example, after that battle we had, let's say we had a couple of damaged tripods, and then we've got three tripods that aren't damaged. We would put them back up into. I'll zoom back out a little bit. we would put them back into their circle just like so even though i'm i'm blocking it off so let's as an example let's pretend it was wave three we put these back up here to show that these are the tripods that are part of wave three so uh one other way for you for the humans to win is if there are no tripods or cylinders on the map then the humans will win so uh as i mentioned before with the martians the martians can win if they destroy dc martians can win if they get the four pieces to the to the flying machine they can also win if they get to 100 victory points which basically moves their Every 10 victory points, it's moving their colonization. Uh, the humans can win if the germs get to 10, which basically represents 100 human victory points. Then that means that uh, the human germs have eliminated the Martians. Uh, also, they can win if there are no Martian tripods or cylinders left on the board. So... Once again, do you want to point out this flying machine can be pretty weird because these pieces can come fast and furious and end the game rather quickly. Um, sea battles, sea battles are pretty easy. Uh, you're not going to have a bunch of tripods because you only have like five tripods that are at sea. 
uh, that you can draw from. So you're not going to run across a lot of tripods. Uh, but what you do is you'll have your freighters. These are the freighters. Let's say, say we had three refugees that are trying to escape. And I decide I'm going to spend eight on a couple of warships. So these would be the warships here. So what we're doing here is in the land battles, it's like the Martians that are doing all the moving. In the sea battle, it's it's us trying to trying to move our freighters to this point here, to this line here. So that means they they basically escape, and then we get the victory points for those uh, refugees that escape. Uh, like I said, you don't run into a lot of the sea battles. You've got way more land battles than anything else. And that is pretty much the process of the game. You're going to go through your production phase. You're going to go through your battle phase. The battle phase can take some time, especially when you've got a few different waves and you've got different armies that you've set up across the uh, Midwest as well as the East Coast. You get the devastation phase, which can be, no pun intended, devastating to you because you can get huge chunks of production just completely wiped out. Your workforce is wiped out. It's basically those humans are being annihilated by the Martians. Uh, you got the human action phase, which allows you to do some movement with your units, do some special stuff with your infantry and your cavalry. You got your escape phase is when your your uh, refugees are moving. They're trying to get away. Then you've got the Martian action phase, which determines where these waves are moving, what states are they going to, uh, which I actually think is pretty cool because what they do is really based on how much production is left in that region they're in. So I like, I like how uh, that operates there as well. And then the last thing is the assembly phase where you've got cylinders that have landed and the assembly machines are trying to put the tripods together. Uh, as far as like strategy, it's very important. Even though the, the infantry is uh, pretty weak, I mean, it really doesn't, they can't damage the tripods and that. It's important to keep some infantry around because when you have a cylinder land, because you will get more cylinders landing as you get more victory points. So when you hit, um, when your germ level, which is basically when you get 30 victory points, 60 victory points, and 90 victory points, those are gonna trigger new cylinders that will land. And those new cylinders are going to have five tripods in each one. So when those tripods land, it's important to have some infantry nearby that you can possibly send them in and destroy some of those tripods before they get assembled. So that's something to kind of forget about sometimes when you're really just focusing on, you know, the big guns that can take down the, um, the tripods. Uh, other aspect too is, and I really didn't talk about it that much because it is a variant, although it is pretty cool, is uh, the Tesla research where you're researching different things uh, as far as Nikola Tesla and you actually earn these like little Tesla research counters that you can put on to these different different things like radio and the death rate and the airship. And of course, don't forget, we've got Tesla's tripod. So that's pretty sweet as well. Uh, I, I played uh, once with the, uh, with the Tesla uh, variant to it and it does really change the game up a lot I mean you end up spending a lot of your resources on trying to get uh, this new technology as opposed to you know purchasing ships and well I should say guns and cavalry and infantry and that so uh, so it's pretty cool I, I enjoyed it but I, I played twice just without that just as the straight humans versus the Martians and uh, enjoyed that as well. So that's pretty much how you play the War of the Worlds USA East Coast Edition. So what are my final thoughts on my review score? So as I pointed out before, uh, when I first started the review, I found the rules to be kind of tricky, 
to get through, uh, you kind of got to, like I said, it, things aren't as intuitive as I would have thought. And um, I just kind of had a hard time with it. Not to say that they're terrible, but you do have to take some time to let this stuff sink in. And uh, you, it's it's a situation where you got to make sure you've got all your stuff right in front of you, all your tokens and, and the map and the cards and everything when you're learning how to play the game as opposed to just reading the rules. You know, a lot of times I'm famous for just busting out the rule book to read it. Uh, you will have an easier time learning the game if you actually have all the counters, all the cards, the map laid out, everything else. And I see Pinky has decided she's going to start caterwauling here towards the end of the show. Relax, Pinky. Jeez. I don't know. Crazy cat. So, uh, so yeah, so the rules were, yeah. Um, I, it's, it, to me, it's like pointless to have the standees because the standees, it's very difficult to get the, the counters into the standees. And uh, if you try, you're going to trash those counters. I guarantee that. So that's, I got to ding it on that as well. Um, this could be laid out better. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good information on this. But it should have been dual-sided with some other stuff to prevent you from having to constantly be looking in the book to check things out, such as, uh, like, the battle plans, right? It's kind of like, oh, so I got a battle plan for my cavalry, and it's this. Uh, what is that again? What, do I, what does it do again? What does line of sight do? What does surprise shot do? Should have kind of been... Should have been on this as well. Uh, other than that... Uh, I think the component quality is nice. Uh, cards are good card stock. Uh, it's a little lacking in the artwork department, but that's okay. It, it's, you know, it's all black and white. It's all line drawings. But then again, it's supposed to be like the turn of the 20th century. So I can get that. I don't have a big issue with that. Uh, I do like the board. Although it does does get a little cluttered off to the side where we're, we're tracking all these different things on the zero through 10 uh, track with the victory points and production points and stuff like that. Uh, but the rest of it is great. Uh, as far as the gameplay itself, it's got tons of replayability. I like how the AI is set up as far as you're just rolling the dice. It's telling you what the Martians do. I like the fact that... Um, that like the devastation phase can be like like holy shit <laughs> you're like oh my gosh they just wiped out like 25 production points from the united states it's like holy jeez um so i like that I like that aspect of it as well i like how the uh, the ai will move the waves around depending on uh what's uh what's going on with the production level of the region that they're in so like if a region is destroyed or it's got red weed they're not going to hang out they're going to tend to move so move on to someplace else so i like that but that's pretty cool too so all in all it's it's not an easy game to win especially if you're just playing it without the tesla uh variant to it so i find it very challenging i like that as well uh one thing the the battles are a little I don't want to say bland, but there's not as much variety to them as I would have liked to have seen. But you figure that's the, the actual battles themselves are not like the main focus of the game. The main focus of the game is more of a, a strategic level approach to how are you going to defeat the Martians as opposed to each and every battlefield. So, I, you know, like I said, I, w I wish I, there was a little more variety to it. But it's okay. And, and the battles play fairly quickly, too. Usually, the humans are getting wiped out. <laughs> you're, you're hoping maybe to take a tripod or two out with your guns, fingers crossed. But uh, that doesn't happen too often. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, I give the War of the Worlds USA East Coast Edition a very, very solid 8.7. Uh, as a solitaire game, it's very entertaining. I have enjoyed myself. It did take a little bit longer for me to kind of wrap my head around some of the rules. I would take a stab in the dark. There's probably some rules that I'm still getting wrong. It's more because of the presentation of the rule book than anything else. But I'm still having a damn good time playing it. 
plus it's a $60 game from Danvers and Games. That's a little lower price point than we're used to seeing for a lot of Danvers and Games. And as I had mentioned before, you can find it online for about $43. If you do that, and I'm not telling you you have to go to an online retailer, but if you do that, man, you're, you're getting a hell of a lot of gaming for your 43 bucks. All right, so that is it for tonight's show. As I mentioned on tomorrow's show, I am going to page through and take a first look at both the Agent's Handbook and the Handler's Guide for Delta Green from Arc Dream Publishing. So this, this is going to be a big show tomorrow. So once again, probably not going to be any, uh, any news. Maybe a couple of news pieces if there's something super exciting going on. So anyway, as I like to point out, uh, by all means, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like the videos on the channel, please subscribe. Don't forget, I've got two contests going on right now. One is for YouTube subscribers and the other is for Twitter followers. Be sure to check out the contest video. I'm not gonna rehash it right here, right now. But anyway, if you like the channel, be sure to subscribe. Don't forget, ring that little bell. It'll tell you when I upload new videos as well as inform you when the stream goes live too. So as I like to say, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, by all means, go visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. By now, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. As I mentioned, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll be taking a look at Delta Green. So until then, happy trails. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.